I'm hearing from Bonnie that you've got some packages on order. I'm sure some of you have nukes. And of course, you have hives in your backyard or nearby, of course, that you can do those increases with or replacement for those winter losses. So I'm going to try to see if we can set up the screen share to make sure that you're seeing the right screen. Hopefully, you're seeing a little bee on a, some uh, flowers there. And then we will. Yes, we can see that. OK. So <clears throat> what to do in preparation for the spring flow, increasing your hives, decreasing the swarms, and promoting sustainability to make sure that your bees are making it not just through this year, but next year and beyond, hopefully. So all of us are, are familiar with what the spring flow can do. Uh, we can go from a few pounds of, of honey inside of our hives to, to over 100 or more. Um, unfortunately, our spring flow, uh, when most of that nectar gathering, when most of that um, brood buildup, when most of the queen rearing and everything else that goes on in a hive occurs is during a, a very short six to eight week period. And so we, we want to aim for that start of that, that season when the nectar flow starts, when the major nectar flow starts, and get our bees through that so that we can maximize not just the production of the honey, but the production of the bees as well. Because those are the, the two things that are going to carry the colony, the hive, through the year into the next spring so that they can do this all over again. So everything that you do before this time period, after this time period, is all geared towards that six to eight weeks that um, your bees are going to maximize the amount of, of, uh, uh, of food and, and brood and bees and everything else that goes on. So in order to think about spring, <coughs> or the seasons, I should say, <coughs> many times we look at it as astronomical or meteorological. In the astronomical, we're looking at the, uh, the dates of the equinoxes. When is the, uh, you know, when does spring start? March 21st, now days that everybody's calling it March 22nd. Um, or is it the first day of the month, that meteorological season? And what we find is, as beekeepers or as, as stewards of the bees is that neither one of these are accurate. Both of these have some inaccuracy in them because really spring is more, uh, less a season than it is a state of mind. And I use reference to a few years ago, um, back in on March 23rd, my son was, was sledding in snow. I know that's a, appropriate for a day like today where we had so much snow yesterday. Um, but in 2013, uh, we had a snowfall basically the day after spring started. <clears throat> but the year later, a month before that spring was occurring, we had such warm temperatures that things were in bloom in February. And we were looking at swarms occurring in that February period. And so for our bees, we're not looking at the calendar. We're not looking at, you know, when is that, that uh, uh, winter solstice or uh, spring equinox and, and as far as our season. We're not looking at the 1st of December or the 1st of March on the calendar. We're looking to see what's going on in the environment around us and sort of looking ahead um, in, in those weather reports that, as to what's going to occur. Um, some of you have, have seen me talk before and you know that this, this is not what I usually wear on my face. Usually I, I'm clean shaven. But my daughter uh, asked if I could uh, play the Santa Claus role down in South Carolina for her, for her children because due to COVID, uh, access to Santa Claus just wasn't happening this year. So I told my wife I wasn't going to keep it very long and, and, and earlier uh, last week I told her, told my family, I said, Thursday of this week, I'm shaving it off because it's going to be 50s, it's going to be 60s, we're going to have a nice warm uh, time period after that. So once we get this through this cold period of Monday, Tuesday, so forth, get into Thursday, Friday, it's going to be warm, I can shave it off, it can, it can be no problem. And I'm looking at the weather report and next Monday it's supposed to be a high of 25 in Richmond. So this may stick around a little bit longer. But that's one of the things that we have the advantage of as beekeepers um, is that we can look at that long-term forecast 
you know, not just one or two days out, we can look seven days, 10 days out, we can look long term as to what weather patterns are coming in from California, um, off the Pacific coast, and is expected to hit out here a week, two weeks later, we can see what's coming up from the Gulf Coast, um, from the from Africa, um, for, as far as those hurricanes and tropical storms and so forth, what's coming our way in order to plan ahead for what our bees are going to be subjected to. And so we need to be watching the weather reports and, and paying attention to what types of, of uh, weather patterns are forming long term in order to plan for what our bees are going to be seeing and what they, how they're going to react. Because they're not reacting to the calendar. They're not reacting to um, to what we want them to do. They're reacting to the environmental conditions, in particular, temperatures. And so, <clears throat> again, spring is not tied to a calendar. It's tied more to what uh, some of you have heard my talks on growing degree days. What we look at is those growing degree days. How far along temperature-wise do our plants develop and progress, and how fast are they doing that? In some years, they're much further ahead than others. Um, this in 2019, uh, our growing degree days were um, probably about 25% behind where we were the next year in 2020. And as a result, as many of you may remember, we had a lot of swarms and we had uh, early swarms that occurred this past past spring, and they went on for a while too. And so those are some of the things again that we want to be planning for in watching the weather, watching the, the temperatures in particular because their plant life is tied to those temperatures just like our bees are tied to it. <clears throat> so what can we expect in general as far as the development of the colony? Let me see if I can, there we go. So what we want to look at is that seasonal fluctuation of our brood nest, our adult population inside of the hive, and plan our, our, our management accordingly. Now, I've got this on a calendar basis, as you can see, which totally goes against everything that I've just said. But it gives you a, a, a good idea of what to expect and when. And so if we look at that spring period, looking at that, that February, middle of February through March and April into May, that's where most of the growth of the population is going to occur. We see most of the brew production. And so we want to be gearing our management to maximize the brew production, maximize the adult production so that we can maximize the population of bees and the resources that they can gather in through it for, for planning for the next year, planning for the upcoming winter, planning for the dearth in summer, planning for the next spring buildup. <clears throat> now we hopefully will get a little bit extra that we can take off some honey, but our main goal is to make sure they have what they need to make it through, again, that dearth season that we see in the summertime when there's, there's plenty of green, but there's not a whole lot of nectar. And then into the fall when we see hopefully a few tropical storms come through where we might see a, a, a bit of a bump in nectar flow, um, but not anywhere close to what we saw back in the spring. And then that long dearth period from October, November, December, January into February before things start happening again. So everything is geared towards the spring period, making sure that we can maximize that production. So what do you need to do as far as your spring um, is concerned, or I should say pre-spring if you're going by the calendar, because this should be starting right now. Um, you know, many of our, our colonies have already started brood production. Um, we are seeing a decline in the populations, a rapid decline in the populations as the the, the uh, effects of varroa mites and, and diseases, pests and so forth that are in our hives are causing our bees to, to die off and the cluster is getting smaller. And so we want to go in as a pre-spring management in that February period and look to see, number one, of course, which hives are alive. What do we have available to um, provide resources to our, uh, to our bees for? Um, and make sure that they can, that they have uh, an ability to make it into that spring flow, to build up to it. What's the colony status? 
Um, again, we're seeing a population decline, the cluster is getting smaller. As we get into that uh, fluctuation in temperatures that we're going to be seeing this week, where it's going to be 30s today, it's going to be 50s on Fridays, it's going to be 20s on Monday, that cluster is going to be expanding and contracting in response to that. And so it's <clears throat> it's that, that population of bees that is maintaining the survival of the colony during this very stressful period where the colonies are, are breaking apart uh, the cluster, um, going out doing defecation flights, maybe find the, finding some food resources, bringing those back to the hive, starting that brood production. Um, and then once that brood production starts, that colony is committed to staying on that brood and making sure that brood has the right temperature, 92 degrees, in order to survive. And so that's where the cluster position comes in, is that at this time of year, with brood in your hive, that cluster is not going to move around like it could earlier last December when there was, wasn't any brood or very little brood, that they can move around to maintain contact with the honey, with the pollen, with the food resources that they need. Now they're committed to staying on that brood that the queen has started to lay eggs for and they're starting to feed and, to, and develop into the larva and uh, through the larval stage, through the pupil stage and hopefully become adults. So we have to be concerned about what the position of the cluster is in relationship to that food resources. You know, again, uh, we wanna make sure they have that food, particularly the honey contact in order for them to generate enough warmth when those cold days come in, really cold days like Monday, that they can generate enough heat to keep the brood developing. And that temperature is gonna be 92, 93 degrees Fahrenheit, constant, or they're gonna risk losing the brood and essentially the colony itself. So their, their goal is to get replacement bees. And those replacement bees are the brood that's in the hive now. So is food available? Is there honey? Is there pollen to feed to the brood? But more importantly, where is it located in, in relationship to, this, to the cluster? And that's mainly your job is to make sure as a beekeeper to make sure they have constant contact with that honey in order to survive. Now I stuck this picture over here on here. This is a, uh, a picture of the thermal regulation inside of the hive. You can see where the, where the cluster is located here, uh, where they are uh, more than likely where the brood is and so forth. But I, I often ask this question, what's wrong with this picture? If you can see the outline of the colony here, the main things that we're, that we're concerned about here is the fact that this is where the honey is. This is where the brood is. So if there's no um, honey in this range here <clears throat> between the top bar, bottom bar, before they can get up into the honey, this cluster has lost contact with, with a, a necessary resource, that, that, that power uh, or fuel in order to survive. And so we want to... <clears throat> Early in the year, or I should say late last year, what this person should have done was to minimize the, the size of this hive, to force those bees down to the bottom and get off any extra colonies here, because this basically is a heat sink up here. When it gets 30 degrees, 20 degrees at night, this is going to freeze, and it's going to take days before it thaws out. And so all the heat that's coming out, that's radiating out of this cluster, is going to be drawn up into this cold spot causing more stress, more uh, need for making more heat by this cluster. And so there's things that you should have done, could have done early in the year, or I should say late last year again, um, in order to maximize the potential for this colony to survive. Yeah, it's got plenty of heat, but again, where's the honey in relation to that cluster? <clears throat> so your spring management, your responsibility is to provide aid and comfort to the bees, making sure that they have um, plenty of food, that they have uh, a, a viable queen who is laying. And again, she should be laying this time of year. She should have been starting probably back at the end of December, first of January, in order to make the, to, um, to uh, provide uh, the next generation of the offspring um, that's needed for the, um, for, the, for the bees to survive. The other thing that you want to look at as you're going into there, and I apologize, my mother decided to call me right in the middle of this, so um, I'll call her back. Um, 
<clears throat> the other things that you want to do, and again, this is this is spring management. You shouldn't be afraid to go into the hive to at least look to see what's going on. Uh, a day like today, you don't want to be doing that. Um, you want to go in on a day like uh, later this week, Wednesday uh, or Thursday, when it starts to get warmer. Friday might be a little iffy because it's supposed to rain, but you want to go in there and just make a quick check. It doesn't mean pull apart the entire hive. It just means look to see inside the hive, to look to see um, do they have what they need. And like I said, the first thing is a viable queen. Do you need to search through the whole hive to find out that you have a queen? Or do you just need to see that first frame that has brood on it and say, yep, got it, put it back together. When you pull out that brood, is the pattern, does it look good? Um, this time of year, you probably don't need to be doing that. Later in the spring, um, you want to look to see what the brood pattern is a little more consistently. Um, look to see what the comb status is. Look to see what the hive condition is. You know, is it, is it uh, is maintain its integrity? Is it well painted? It's not soaking up a lot of moisture. It doesn't have a lot of holes in it. What's the apiary location? Are, they, are you getting good uh, production out of the bees as far as the numbers of bees and the amount of honey that they're producing. Are they having problems with, um, with diseases, which could be a relationship to you know, what the, that, that hive um, situation? So what you wanna do is to go in, like I said, this time of year, middle of February in particular, go through, do the basic, um, do I have bees? Is the queen laying? Does the, you know, is, the, is the cluster close to food? And then close it up. As we get later into, into um, later February, 1st of March, depending on the temperatures and so forth, do a little more extensive um, review of what's going on. But as far as, as finding hey, another location. Excuse me, Matt. Um, Keith, yeah. uh, we have a question from Matt. And he wanted to know if your population and brood graphs take into consideration the feeding that most <laughs> of us are doing. Um, it, it, no, it doesn't. Um, so we're going to be start talking about the feeding and supplement and so forth. Um, what we are <clears throat> most concerned about, though, is that, you know, is the population responding? And of course, if we're stimulating them, it's going to, they're going to hopefully respond a little better and stronger um, than if they weren't uh, provided with that stimulant feed, supplement feed. Um, but one of the things I, I, I should have mentioned, that graph that you saw was, was put together from Blacksburg um, B. So several years ago, we went through and charted through the season, uh, the number of bees, number of amount of brood and, and so forth that was in a hive. <clears throat> and, and that we've used that, uh, Rick Fell and I, others, I think James Wilson is using them now. So we've been using that for a number of years. But the thing to remember is that that graph is representative, representative of how the colony responds, but not necessarily how it responds in your area. One of the things that, we, that I talk to the beekeepers about is the fact that latitude and, and altitude matter. Um, the higher the altitude, um, the higher the latitude, um, the later in the year you're going to start seeing that growth. The later in the year you're going to see that, that response of the colony. And to some extent, so you get up to Canada and Alaska, it's going to be much more constricted. So that six to eight weeks, maybe three or four weeks, um, where the rest of the year um, and the, the time period that we see the, the colony going broodless. In, in uh, Richmond, we usually see it for a couple of weeks, maybe. Um, but in other areas of the state, Highland County, so forth, or like I said, up further north Canada, that could be weeks or months before the queen starts to lay. So use that as a guide, but not as a concrete, this is what the bees are gonna do this time of year. Your bees are gonna react differently because of, of where they are. Um, they're gonna react differently because from year to year. Um, so again, it's a guide, not, not a rule of what to, what's going on. But let me get back to the, um, to the apiary location and the spring management. Um, <clears throat> one, the, the, thing, the best thing about winter is that the bees are going to get lighter. The hives are going to get lighter. You're gonna condense it. The bees are gonna eat up honey. Um, February is probably gonna be the best time to find a new apiary location. If you need to find one, it's got better sunlight. It's got better, um, better resources uh, as far as the nectar. It's got better access to water. It's got better access for you. February is the best time of year to do that for a number of reasons. One is that the hives are never gonna be lighter. 
the bees are never going to be smaller. The population is never going to be smaller. And you don't have to do it at night. Um, if you go out, um, again, a day like today, even though, again, snowfall, you're not going to do it. But if it's a, you know, relatively dry day and it's 30 degrees or 40, 40 degrees, those bees are going to be in the hive. And so you don't have to wait until night to wait for the bees to come back and close it up. You can make that move during the daylight when it's when it's safer, uh, when you can see what you're doing, and and uh, and you can get usually get help a little bit easier um, to do that. So apiary location, evaluate that to see if that's something that you need to adjust, um, or if you want to expand into a new location. This is the time of year to start making that expansion if you can move a few hives in just to kind of establish it itself. <clears throat> the diseases, pest levels, you want to look to see what's going on um, as for inside the hive as far as that, uh, is there, are there diseases present? You know, are we starting to see sac brood, chalk brood, or are we starting to see European fowl brood? Populations are going to be low, so the chances of that this time of year in February is going to be pretty low. But once we get into March, as the population, as the brood population starts to increase, that's when we start seeing things that can be, can be detected. Um, so much of that is tied to moisture. And so the more we can reduce the moisture, increase the ventilation inside of the hive, increase the sunlight, the drying, uh, the warming of the hive earlier in the, in the, in the, in the day, um, the better off the bees are gonna be, the less problems we generally see with the, the diseases. Um, pest levels, um, if you didn't know it, if you, any small high bees that you went into winter with, they're going to come out of winter. Um, those adult bee or adult beetles will live throughout the winter, just like your bees do, and they will survive in the cluster, near the cluster, um, taking advantage of the warmth of the bees, much like mice that get inside of the hive, um, to provide them uh, an ability to survive through the through the winter and then become uh, more of a problem possibly the next year. So your pest levels are things that you want to be paying attention to as well, both the invertebrate, but more importantly, invertebrate being the varroa mites and the small high beetles, but more importantly at this time of year, the vertebrates. Um, again, small breed population, you should have very little varroa mite reproduction going on. The problem is that as we get into those warmer days, we're starting to see the skunks and the possums and the bears coming out of hibernation and they're going to be looking for a food resource and they love the protein that is offered to them by the adult bees. And so that's generally when we start seeing problems with that. So looking around the hive for um, signs of uh, vertebrates, um, scat and, and uh, scratching on the, on the front of the entrance or if you've got holes in it, scratching around those holes that would induce the bees to come out and defend. Those are signs that you've got a problem with a vertebrate pest in the, in the area. <clears throat> so the brood pattern, as we move on, there we go. <clears throat> the brood pattern, what you want to look at is, to, is, is it's very easy to look and see the, the cat brood and see what's going on. Um, I caution beekeepers about relying just on the cat brood. Um, you should also be looking at the uncapped brood as well, because as you can see here, this was probably okay. You can see we got probably a little ball brood going on here, um, some open spots and so forth of, of late um, egg laying, but for the most part, it's all capped. But if you look at this frame, it looks like it started out quite well filling in, but now we're starting to see some missed spots in here. We're starting to see different ages. Um, throughout, and those are some of the things that we don't want to see. We want to see that uh, consistency a, a, uh, of ages as we um, look from out to in, or in some cases, in to out, <clears throat> so that we know that the, that the larva, not only do we have um, lots of solid brood, the, the larva are making it to the pupil stage as in here, but we also want to make sure that they're all generally the same age as we spiral out to the edges and make sure that as these develop, that they're going to uh, emerge at the same rates, generally the same time, um, taking care of uh, or joining the population. But this also by having a condensed brood nest, having the larva of the same age, that means that the bees, the worker bees, don't have to spread out their resources and their energy or activities 
<clears throat> in order to meet the needs of younger larvae and, and older larvae and so forth, in, you know, situated in between. Now, of course, this is the ugly part of it, is that you see lots of gaps in here. Yeah, we've got some capped in here, but a lot of the, uh, a lot of openness and so forth, these are things that we don't want to see. Um, again, like to caution beekeepers, um, you run across this, that's great. You think it's this terrific. You, you um, find a frame that's got open brood eggs, larva uh, moving into the capping or moving from the capping and so forth. Um, you want to look to see what the age of it is. Um, <clears throat> if you pull out a frame that looks like this, a frame that looks like this, and all the others look like that, don't get too upset. <clears throat> Sometimes there, there's a change in the environment. You've got, you got a cold spell coming in. Um, cluster may not have been able to cover up the bees. You lost a little brood on the edges. Um, if generally your, bee, your, your, your frames are looking good, um, don't worry if you have a frame or two that doesn't look as good as you would like. So what do we need as far as speaking of the, of the supplement um, feeding? Um, <clears throat> we want to make sure that the bees have uh, a good supply of carbohydrates, that's the honey, protein, that's the pollen, um, lipids, um, as many of you know, this is one of the things that, that has come out in recent years as to why our bees aren't living as long as they should in the wintertime, but also in the summertime, is that the varomites are feeding on the lipids. And so lipid supplement, vitamin supplement, minerals, those are things, again, that come into the pollen. So we want to make sure that they have, have plenty of honey um, and good um, honey that, that's going to fortify them but also sufficient amount of pollen to be raising the brood um, in order for them to feed, to make the brood food, to feed to the, to the larva, um, to help them to develop and, and mature. Um, sometimes we're gonna to have to supplement that with, uh, with a little bit of sugar water or a sugar supplement, or in the case of the, the protein, lipids, vitamins, so forth, um, there's plenty of others that we can put on there to supplement um, and provide those bees with a, with a way to, to survive. Um, feeding options, <clears throat> you know, it's just like anything in beekeeping, there's lots of opportunities, lots of options that you have, lots of different ways to doing it. Um, the fondant, the mash or slush sugar, where we're taking a pound of sugar, putting a quarter cup of water in it, granulated sugar on the top bars or on, on top of wax paper, division board feeders like you see in here, um, the top feeders um, that, that uh, you know, boxes basically that are converted to hold the, the sugar water for them to come up and feed on, or boardman feeders, entrance feeders that, that the bees can, can feed with. In the springtime, <clears throat> there's a, the, 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 what you use, the fondant, mash, granulated, all of these and so forth, they're going to depend on what time of year you do it. Generally, the fondant, mash, and granulated sugar we're going to use in that winter. It's going to be more of an emergency feed. So we're not going to necessarily want to feed that in the springtime, that February through March period where we're wanting to build up the colony, to stimulate the colony, to, to uh, produce more, more brood, more bees. What we're going to want to look at is having a liquid formulation for them to feed on. It's much easier for the workers to, um, to manipulate. It also provides them with a water source that they don't have to go out and get. And they do need that water as well as the carbohydrates. So the division board feeders, top feeders, Boardman feeders, yeah, don't generally recommend those because there's a concern that the leaking uh, could lead to robbing and so forth, or if the colony is too small inside, they wouldn't be able to protect the entrance from robbers. So generally we'd recommend that you stay away from the Boardman feeders, entrance feeders, and stay with inside feeding for the bees. So that not only can they, <clears throat> can they have access to it, um, but they can protect it from the others. And by access, I mean that Again, you know, as we get into those warm, cold days, on a warm day, they can very easily get to the boardman feeder. But on a cold day, if they're up above in some of these supers <coughs> and they're clustering to get out of the cold, they're never going to see this, where they may be clustering up top here that they can get to the, to the top feeder, or they may be clustering next to the division board feeder that they can get into it. So again, generally we recommend that you use a liquid feed and that liquid feed is inside the hive so the bees can get a hold of it, <coughs> can access it on throughout, you know, cold days, warm days, in between days, 
um, without any jeopardy to their, uh, to their survival. So reasons for feeding, uh, generally we have three. It's to start a colony, it's to stimulate the colony, it's to save the colony. Um, start is when you're gonna have uh, the packages come in that Bonnie was talking about, um, nucleus hives or splits that you do where you've got plenty of bees, you've got some honey, but you don't generally have enough. Um, but the primary goal of that in that starting feed is to keep the bees at home so that, uh, the, so that small population can gradually become, or maybe not so gradually, maybe rapidly become a large population. The stimulant feed is to um, give the bees a taste of what they normally would come in contact with as far as the natural nectar, um, the concentration that, that uh, we see uh, sugar water. Um, is similar to what the sugar concentration is in nectars. Um, that's to, um, again, to hopefully keep them home a little bit, but also to stimulate them or, or have them stimulate the queen to lay more eggs to be building up. The save, of course, is, to, um, is the fact that they don't have contact with the honey or they don't have any honey or a sufficient amount of honey and that you want to save them, you want to get some sugar on them um, to get them through that short period, uh, hopefully a short period, in which they will be uh, 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 devoid of, of any sugar, honey um, contact, and can allow them to survive that period to the point where they can get um, contact with it later. Generally, what we look at as far as concentration, starting is a one-to-one -one sugar water concentration. Um, stimulant feed is one part sugar, two parts water, again, much closer to the nectar. And the save is the one is the two parts sugar, a heavy syrup, uh, one part water. And in spring feed, this is generally what we look at. We look at the start um, for those new colonies, whether the packages, nukes, splits, or however you started it, swarms collected, and stimulant feed. Um, this time of year, uh, in a few weeks, I'm going to be starting. I shouldn't say a few weeks. In about about a week from now, uh, once this this cold next cold spell passes. I'll likely be starting to, that stimulant feed in order to stimulate the queen's production of eggs. It says, how do you, uh, how do, you do liquid in extreme cold? You don't. Um, again, <clears throat> if we're gonna be doing, um, saving them and it's extreme cold, we're not gonna be using a liquid. We're gonna be using the, the fondant. We're gonna be using the, um, the mash. We're gonna be using the, the um, the uh, granulated sugar, and we're gonna put it right where the bees are. If we're getting a stimulant feed, what we wanna do is to give them a access to it, but they don't have to have continuous access to it because that's not their primary source of, of sugar. So it shouldn't be an extreme cold. We should be at a time period of which, what we're seeing now actually, um, where it's gonna be, yeah, it's, it, it may be 30 today, it may be 20 next week, but in between, we're gonna be in the 50s and the 60s. And the bees can expand that cluster, get into it, and then bring it back. They can make defecation flights. They can do um, you know, a little bit of foraging for maples or maybe even some dandelions that are in bloom and bring back a little bit of pollen. So we're not gonna be um, using the liquid during those extreme cold long-term periods, we're going to be using the, the more solid sugars and place those where the cluster is in order for them to survive and make it through that extreme cold. So just like the sugar, <clears throat> we can have um, uh, feed supplements that include the pollen, uh, whether it's a substitute, um, the old brewer's yeast and, and soybean uh, flour. Um, supplement with a little bit of, of, uh, of pollen, 10% natural pollen. Um, now we have manufactured products that, um, that can be fed to them to increase the nitrogen supplement, mineral supplements that we have, vitamins, uh, nutrients. Um, all of those are accessible from a lot of our suppliers. Um, the thing that we're seeing now is that, again, is you know, relating back to that bromite and the lipid and so forth, is that we're seeing um, it, not just from the pests and the problems inside of the hive, but the diversity of foods that are out there during the normal year uh, can be very limited in certain areas. And so they may not have that variety of food that we enjoy as, you know, when we go to the grocery store, 
um, they may have a limited variety. And, and one of the things that we are learning in the bee diet now is that they need to have a variety of sources of pollen um, in order for to get all of the different factors, all the different nutritions that they need in order to survive. And so sometimes, you know, we may have to supplement. Again, if you're seeing uh, problems as far as the health in, in the, of the bees, you know, it, it maybe it won't be uh, a, a problem to, um, to supplement with that honeybee healthy or some of the other products that are out there um, to help to help the bees to survive. <clears throat> the other thing that we want to do uh, as far as the as far as the hive is concerned is to make sure that we're doing a comb rotation. Um, everybody knows what the 20% rule is. 20% of the work is or 100% or of the work is done by 20% of the of the bee club. Uh, 20% solution that we that you know you hear about with the with the Sherlock Holmes and so forth. There's a lot of 20% rules out, that are out there. The same is true inside of the hive. Uh, in order to minimize the potential for the problems from disease in particular in the future, what we need to do is to rotate out the old comb that's inside of our hives. And generally, what we recommend is that you take out at least 20%. Um, you know, yeah, you can lean towards the 10%, but we like the 20%. So two frames from each box each year should come out to remove that old dark comb um, that you can see here. Um, that is, that has probably um, got residue of, of uh, spores from the SEMA. It may have some spores of American fowl brood. Uh, it may have some viral content in there, but you can also see lots of drone comb that's in here. But the other thing is that these cells of the workers over time keep getting filled in. And so over time, you're gonna be producing smaller and smaller bees. And I know that, that there's, a, there's a concern out there or, or a view out there that's the small cells producing small bees gives you resistance to a lot of things um, that are out there. What we're actually finding is that's not true. The cell size varies the bee size varies between the different lines or strains of, of honeybees. And so we wanna make sure that we've got the best, most productive bee that's out there. And if we let this go um, for year after year after year, tens, couple of decades and so forth, um, eventually we're gonna be producing smaller, weaker bees that are less um, able to survive and more susceptible to some of the diseases and the problems that are out there. So getting that draw, uh, old uh, dark comb out, replacing it uh, with a, with a uh, new foundation or clean frames with clean frames um, and foundation, um, that will help to minimize some of the disease problems that we have, um, increase the productive capabilities of the hive. And so that, that's one of the things, again, that 20% rules, um, you should be taking out at least two frames out of each box, brood comb, supers, um, each year and replacing with um, a frame of uh, new frame or clean frames with foundation for them to, um, to draw it out. And if you want to do the wedge bar, let them draw out natural comb, that's fine. The important thing is to get that old comb out on a regular basis, to rotate it out. <clears throat> now, the diseases, the pests um, are varied, um, they're numerous, and they're not, in, not that different from what we typically see in our own uh, populations. Um, we're now de we're dealing with the COVID virus. Um, the flus have been uh, issues for many years. Um, bacteria, when we start getting cuts in our, uh, on our hands, we start putting antiseptic on there to keep bacteria from growing. Fungi, uh, you know, the, the um, uh, problems that we have with, with wet feet and so forth. So the bees aren't any different than us. It's just that their diseases, their, their, uh, may be a little different. Where we um, would look at, at uh, uh, septicemia and so forth, um, they're looking, with, you know, with the bees, we're looking at American fowl brood, European fowl brood, um, chalk brood for the fungus, um, the deformed wing virus, uh, Israeli acute, acute paralysis virus and so forth. The sac brood uh, that you see up here, those are things that we, uh, we're concerned about. And then for the past, again, number one on the list, on everyone's list is the varroa mite because there's so many problems that are associated with it. Um, but the small animals, um, the, the, the skunks, the possums, the, um, 
the uh, raccoons, those things that the mice that can get into your hives, not necessarily to um, to feed on the bees themselves, although that's what we see with the skunks and, and possums and so forth, um, but just disrupting their behavior uh, by building nests in it like the mice. Um, so making sure that you, for the like the mice, uh, making sure you don't take that entrance reducer out too soon, um, because you know as the as the days get warmer. Mice are going to come out of hibernation. They're going to come out of the places where they overwintered. They're going to be looking for a nice protected cavity, just like your bees do, in order to build their nest. And your beehives are number one on the list for that. So make sure you leave that entrance reducer in there long enough so that it's past that time where the mice have started their nesting behavior. With the skunks and so forth, make sure that you've got some uh, prevention from them, whether it's uh, you've got some, uh, uh, you know, if you've had problems with skunks in the past or you have uh, skunks in your area, um, some tacks along the uh, entrance or elevating the hives, making sure that they are, are having difficulty getting to those entrances to disturb them. And of course, the large animals, um, it's, well, we're number one on that list, but number two on the list are the bears. And so if you've been having problems with bears or you hear about bears in your area, um, you wanna take proper precautions and you wanna do that prevention before it becomes a problem. Because if, if, if you hear nothing else from this, this lecture, it's that once bears get into your hive, nothing's gonna stop them from getting back into it except moving the hives. Because they're gonna go, if they know there's food on the other side of that electric fence, they'll endure that, that, that electrical shock and get into those hives uh, in order to get that food. So make sure that you, you take those preventive measures, those prevention, those uh, things, uh, the that, that deterrence um, to the small animals as well as the large animals before they become a problem. Let's see, can you leave a mouse guard on all year long as a precaution? Yes, as long as you've got good ventilation. Um, as you know, you're reducing the entrance. And so it can be uh, a problem as far as the air circulation through, particularly in the summertime when it becomes warm. So as long as they've got good ventilation inside of the hive, you can leave the, the mouse guard on all year. Um, do you position the clean frames in the old frame spot or is there a preferred location? My preference is to put it in the middle um, to make sure that they, you know, those are the ones that they're working first. So if you put it on the outside, um, generally, what I do is I tend to rotate the older comb to the outside through the years and remove those and then put the new ones in the center. And that way I know, uh, have a better idea of what needs to come out, what's been in there the longest. Because sometimes the color and, and condition of the comb isn't a real good indicator of how long it's been in there. And I think I've missed a question in here. Let's see, if you freeze a couple of frames each year, does that, is that rotating the new frames? Um, no. <laughs> uh, what you want to, again, what you're doing is you're getting the residue of the diseases, um, the problems of those smaller cells and so forth out of the hive. So you want to take that comb out completely, um, you know, it's, it's, and get rid of that comb itself. It's not a matter of, let me pull it out, freeze it, kill off anything that's in there. You've still got uh, things that, that can reside in there because freezing is not going not to kill off the American fowl brood spores. Um, freezing is not going to make those cells get any larger. So you want to take that old comb out, get rid of it. You can use the honey, um, you know, bottle it with the rest of your honey you, you have, but um, get that old comb out and make sure that they have, um, have good uh, comb to start with and to draw out new comb off, off of that foundation or draw out new comb. Besides electric fence, what else to do to protect from bears? Um, uh, noises, uh, you know, anything that you can get out there. I don't encourage you to use pyrotechnics because that um, could lead to fires. But if you've got something that, um, you know, is, is uh, uh, rigged up to, uh, with a photo cell um, to make noise off of a recording, um, if you can um, set up something that, that um, uh, would alert you or, or flash um, to cause disruption to the bees, make them uncomfortable, uh, excuse me, to the bears to make them uncomfortable. 
Um, those are things that you can use. So electric fence is, is and sometimes, you know, it can be a hazard. It's not something you want to use around kids for sure. Um, but uh, there are alternatives, uh, like I said, noise maker of some kind, um, elevating the hives above. Um, but, the, but the other thing is, is to know the habits of the bears. Bears generally follow the tree line. And so you don't want to put your bees in the tree line or along the tree line. Move them up into the field, out in the open, um, where the bears are less likely to come in contact with them. Uh, but as far as the, the pests, diseases, and so forth, um, you want to learn what the impact of those various diseases and pests are on your bees, on you. You want to find out what's the best sampling methods for it. Um, you know, the bacteria and so forth that, you know, that could be just a swab um, in, in, uh, in finding out if, if um, uh, you know, the hanging drop method for the American fowl brood. Um, we've got things to be uh, look at as far as nosema, uh, the invertebrates. That's real easy. Um, if you do the sugar shake or the alcohol wash or even the sticky board, um, I know that's a little more difficult in the wintertime and this time of year. Um, but, you know, as we get later in the season, um, any of those methods to see, to monitor the population inside of your hive. Now the chalk brood, the sack brood and so forth, that's going to have to be going into the hive, examining the, um, <clears throat> the comb, looking to see if you see these diseases, um, things like that are very visible, like the uh, deformed wing virus. Those are things that, that um, you know, you can see. Unfortunately, other viruses, like I said, bacteria, um, that's in the adult bee, uh, the, the microsporidia nosema that's in the adult bee, that's hard to tell. And so you have to take samples, know how to, know how to, um, to identify it, whether that's microscopic or otherwise, or identify uh, a resource that can do that for you. If you think you have problems with nosema, you know, the USDA lab up, at, up in Beltsville, they're kind of overloaded now, so they're moving a little slow, but that's one of the things that they provide, one of the services they provide. Uh, if you, uh, we're doing sampling for NOSEMA as well as part of our inspections. Um, and know what to do if you do see that, uh, see these problems. What control is out there? What options do you have? Um, look at it from, a, from an IPM, Integrated Pest Management Approach. You know, look to see what you're comfortable with, look to see what your bees are comfortable with, and look to see what's effective in controlling those. Now, you've done everything right. You've done the, you, you've stimulated feed, you've got that queen delay, you've got lots of brood coming in, you've got lots of, lots of bees, you, they're starting to bring in the honey, um, everything is coming up roses, and then all of a sudden, you see this. And for those that are new to beekeeping, that's what's called a swarm taking off. And you can see the hundreds of bees that are um, leaving from the entrance and headed out to, other locations uh, so that they can uh, find a place to build a new nest. Um, the problem is that all of those bees that you spent so much time on to build up and make sure that you've got that, that honey production coming in here, they just left. And just like what we're seeing with relation to the COVID as their workforce diminishes, there's, there, you know, we have less, Less people working at the at the chicken factories and the um, and the you know out in the fields and so forth, we see less production. Um, we're seeing that in beekeeping. Um, you know, talking to some of the suppliers, they're um, they're having a, a harder time this year getting a hold of woodwork and other supplies um, that their manufacturers, their, their producers were providing or their suppliers were providing them because their workforce is smaller in relation to the uh, the COVID nineteen. So. The same thing happens in the hive. If we are midway through anything and all of a sudden half to two thirds of those bees take off, this is the line of production that we see, not this one inside of our hive. And so as you can, you can tell, we see this little dip in what the production is and it, it may have a little bit of a recovery if there's still something out there, but after that, it's just gonna be a steady decline. So that's the one thing we want to avoid. Uh, what we're seeing with the swarming, of course, is the reduced brood production. We've lost the queen. The queen took off with the, with the swarm. And so we've got to have a new queen coming along. And it may be a while before she's out, so she's going to be able to produce. Uh, we see an increase in the brood mortality because we've lost workers. Generally, it's the younger population of bees 
that go with the swarm. And so those are the ones that are taking care of the brood. Those are the ones that we're seeing, uh, you know, not available to take care of the brood. So we start seeing a higher brood mortality. Of course, a worker reduction force, like I said, you can lose half to two thirds of those. The queen's gone. Secondary swarms may occur. We see that in 40% of the populations. Um, you know, that, that video that you saw, I was out, out of the, uh, uh, a beekeeper in, in far Southwest Virginia. <clears throat> And he had probably 150 hives in his in his uh, yard there uh, that we were doing inspection for, so he could do the sale. We had four hives take off and swarm within within an hour. Uh, we're I mean, as I'm walking to the yard, I'm telling telling the other inspectors, I said, "We got swarming going on." They, you know, they didn't understand that the noises that I'm hearing with those of the swarm um, that were leaving the hives. And so we're passing swarms hanging from trees. We're passing swarms that were taken off out, out uh, into you know, the, the, the other state, well over to West Virginia, which is across the state line or, or next to this property. So lots of problems that are, that are gonna occur to that. Um, but the biggest of those is the fact that we're gonna see lower honey production, lower brood production as a result of that. And that could jeopardize the survival of the colony um, not just the swarm, but the colony itself to the next year, because there's no guarantee that that queen cell that they're raising that comes out, that she's going to make it back here to this hive and start laying eggs, or that she's going to mate sufficiently to carry it through to the next year. So we want to avoid swarming if we can. The other thing to remember as far as that new queen, it's going to be two months before she starts to lay. Uh, one of the things that I was looking at this past summer um, was looking at packages and the queen sustainability. And what I was seeing was those packages that had a queen event that lost a queen, <clears throat> it was two months before they started to grow back up again. So here's, the, here's where the population was in that, in that hive of cat, br cat brood cells inside of the hive, not worker bees or so forth, but just the cat brood of replacement bees increases in the population. Went from 16,000 when the queen cell was noticed, down to less than 6,000 that next month. And by the second month, it still hadn't gotten back up to the 16,000 cap cells. The number of frames of brood declined as well. And so when we have a queen event like a swarm, things are going to happen to that colony that could jeopardize its success into the next year. Let's see, there's a thought that the worker population rebounds within approximately two weeks post-swarm. Well, I, I, I kind of question that if the worker population can, can rebound um, because you've got bees that are brand new and that, they, yes, your population might, because you've got all that brood left over from the queen who was evidently laying gangbusters, you can see a population replacement. But the problem is that you don't have a queen to lay eggs to replace those bees that you had that rebound from. So we wanna make sure that we have not just the immediate population, we wanna make sure we have the long-term population. That's, and that comes from a continuous laying of the eggs, not a break of, of several weeks um, that we generally see when we see a queen event occur. So generally for the bees, swarming is a good thing. It's survival of the, of the species. It's, it's gonna be, allow them to um, spread out uh, to minimize the, the pressure on the, the uh, resources of nectar and pollen that are there. It's going to allow them to um, help to avoid uh, some of the pests um, like the bears, like the skunks and so forth um, by sending out new populations around there. And, it, and, it, and so there's survival of the population. That's a good thing for them, but it's a bad thing for us because again, we are potentially losing bees as a result of that because of the stress, because of the risk involved in that. And so we want to take, make sure that we have some prevention and control of that swarming. So prevention is that before the fact, like I was saying with the bears and the other things, get your, your control measures out before it becomes a problem, before they realize that the, that the colony is there, that the hive is there as a resource. You really want to do the same thing with the swarm prevention. We want to intercede before the colony gets too congested and, and we see that 
um, congestion interfering with the spread of the of the uh, Queen's pheromone throughout the colony. We want to make sure that the queen can move around freely and lay eggs, that we've got a population that's growing. So the question is with that prevention, <clears throat> does removing the queen cells help with the with uh, preventing swarms? And the fact is, no. Um, swarming is a behavior that the bees have adopted in relation to, again, that congestion, that lack of queen substance, that 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 urge to go out and found a new colony or new nest site. And so we're dealing with a behavior, um, not just the occurrence of the queen cells. The queen cells are, are a, uh, a, a symptom, if you were, of that behavior. It's not causing the behavior. Clipping the queen cells doesn't work. Again, it's a behavior. Changing the queen's physiology um, isn't going to make, make the worker bees change their mind about whether they need to swarm or not. It's just going to make it more difficult for them to get her out the door in order to make that swarm go. And if they can't get her out, they'll take the others, take one of those new queens with them. Caging the queen, again, doesn't stop the behavior. And so we need to, we need to stop the behavior from occurring in order for it to uh, prevent them from wanting to go out and do that swarm. And the last one on the list, the demery. Um, this is actually something that we do for control. So we really have three options when it comes to swarm prevention. Reversing the brood box, adding supers, and making splits. So reversing the brood box is really easy. Um, this is going to occur usually sometime mid to late March. Once we got a, a population going, um, the bees are going to be moving up to where the honey is um, throughout the winter. Um, so sometime, uh, again, depending on the year, depending on environmental conditions, depending on where you are, latitude, altitude, um, that cluster is going to start hitting the roof and it's not going to be able to go any further. And so they're going to start getting crowded in this upper box. So the easiest thing to do is take that box of bees with the brood, move it to the bottom, take an empty box that's down below or near empty box and move it up to the top. That gives room for the queen to move up and lay eggs here and spread out the worker population as the brood population spreads out into the two boxes. Now, a few weeks later, <clears throat> we're going to start seeing this situation where we've got all young bees, all the old bees are down below because that's where they started. That's where she started laying her eggs and lots of young bees up here. The bees are going to be moving up to the young bees because they don't need to take as much care of the older bees, the cat brood that are down here. Uh, excuse me, old brood, not old bees, old brood that's down here. And so they're going to be moving up here. And again, we're going to be hitting that roof again. So we just take that box that's got the young open brood in it, move it to the bottom, take the cap brood, move it up to the top. That allows the bees, as this cap brood opens up, allows the queen and the bees to move up into this emptying location and they can spread out again, stretch out the brood, reduce the congestion in the brood nest. So we want to do it at least two times that we're doing that reversal in order to maximize the, the effect of the, um, of the uh, swarm prevention measure, measure that we're, we're trying to implement. <coughs> Once we've done it two times, um, you may want to do it a third, but definitely after that second time, that's when you want to start thinking about adding supers. You know, with that reversal, what we're doing is we're basically tricking the bees to thinking they've got more space. They don't have any more space than they actually did before, but they think they do because they've got room to move up into it. Well, it's going to be a time where you've got so many bees in that colony that reversing them isn't going to change the, the congestion in that brood nest. And so that's when we want to start adding supers. And so generally we talk about adding supers about two, three weeks before the major nectar flow. And that's where, again, that growing degree day comes in handy or you know, you want to use old school and, you know, you've got a date that earliest date for when uh, bloom occurs, when a nectar flow occurs. But you want to you want to have that adding supers geared for prior to when that major nectar flow starts, because that's when their populations are going to start to maximize. That's when congestion is going to become most of a problem. That's when it's going to lead into swarming during the nectar flow that reduces the, the possibility of those bees being able to survive to the next. So what we want to do is so we want to add those supers. Um, some of the rules that we go by, um, two is a good number to add, three is better. Um, we used to say always add three. 
now with the small hive beetles coming in and, and other pests that are inside, potentially inside of the hive, generally we're saying eh, maybe we should, you know, add two now and we can always add more later to give the bees more space and to give more space to move the nectar. Because as, that, as the, the nectar supply starts to come in, <clears throat> the bees are going to be spending less time in brood production and more time in honey gathering and in, in storing that food. And so we want to, again, not have that congestion in the near the brood nest. If we add supers to that, it'll allow them to move in and start filling in more and more nectar throughout the hive, um, especially as a, in those supers above, which is where they naturally want to store it. Um, empty space, uh, having a, uh, particularly the drawn comb, um, does stimulate the bees to gather more nectar, so we can increase their brood production by, um, by giving them more space, stimulating it um, by putting on the supers um, more than we probably think they, they could do. They'll, they always turn, you know, prove us wrong and fill it out. Um, drawn comb increases stored honey um, because they don't have to use that nectar in order to make wax. They can just store that, that nectar straight away and convert it into honey. We're also finding that if you have an upper entrance, uh, whether it's a shim or you use a, uh, just offsetting the supers um, a little bit to give a little bit of bee space, um, that upper entrance um, cuts down on the amount of, of uh, movement that needs to go through the brood nest and then increases the amount of honey stores that we generally see. Um, and then lastly, you wanna be cautious about putting the brood, putting the supers on. Um, too early um, or maybe giving it, uh, you know, too close to the brood nest because it is, particularly if it's drawn comb, that's going to give a site that the queen can move up into and start laying eggs. Um, generally, I don't, I don't worry about that. Um, I figure if, you know, a nest is a nest, the bees, you use the comb, it's air. I'm happy with that as long as, as, you know, further down the line, as those cells start to open up from the brood, you fill it up with honey. The problem is going to be that if they have used it for brood production, it is going to be a target for, small, for a wax moths in the future, particularly the uh, greater wax moth. Um, as you pull off those supers, extract the honey, put them in the storage, the, the uh, pupa combs and the residue of the pupa uh, or the larval development in the pupa is going to be attractive to the wax moth and they're going to come in and, and uh, start feeding on that residue of the larva um, and tearing down the comb at the same time. <clears throat> the other thing to do, as I mentioned, uh, with the reversing and the supering is doing splits. And splits are a good way to replace your winter losses from the bees that you've, get, that you've got, um, particularly if you're um, in, the, in the mindset of using survivor bees. Um, you're going to be, if you do a split and it's an open split, let them raise the queen they're gonna be raising queens from their population. So if you've got a hive that's doing well, that's done well for a number of years, doing a split off of that, hopefully we'll continue that genetics and, and help to increase the survivability, the sustainability of, your, of all of your hives. Um, you can increase the number of hives. You can actually reduce the pest disease load by doing the splits because that 20% rule, you're actually doing more than that or maybe doing the same thing of replacing that residue disease um, comb that's in there, um, spreading out into other colonies that are um, have less of a load. Um, <clears throat> the varroa mites and so forth, what we're seeing is that um, a breakage of the brood uh, can help us to at least put the population of, of the varroa mite in check so that they're not having to um, having to increase uh, or continue to increase throughout the spring and summer and becoming a problem in the fall and winter next. Um, it can improve colony disposition um, by reducing the crowding. Your bees are not going to be as defensive um, of, the, of the colony because, you know, you got less bees that are getting into the personal space. And so generally we see smaller colonies are a, have a better disposition than the larger, more compact colonies. Um, again, prevent swarming. Um, by reducing the population, by reducing that congestion. And lastly, and most importantly, um, for many of you is that you can finally say that, hey, I can make some money off of the beekeeping rather than spending money all the time. I actually may be able to make some money. Um, question from Ed is, do you have a recommendation? 
of uh, placement of frames within a super has frames of mixed foundation drawn cone. Um, I, I think that some of you have heard the term of checkerboarding. That's where you're putting the foundation in between the drawn cone. That's a good, it gives a template, um, not only for where to draw the cone, but how far out to draw it. Um, so that's a, you know, that's a good recommendation if you want to put, um, you know, put your drawn cone, uh, a piece of drawn cone, or I should say a frame of drawn cone in between the frames with the foundation and then, you know, comb on the outside of that, that checkerboarding effect can, uh, uh, can be very useful. All right, so what is a split? <clears throat> Basically, you're taking the basic um, uh, split that most beekeepers hear about and you hear recommendations for is to take half of the brood, half of the honey, half of the pollen, and put that in a new hive right there in the bee yard. Uh, generally, they might put a few more bees in that new one because if, you, if you've got a hive at that old site, some of those older bees are going to, I shouldn't say some of them, many of those older bees are going to come back to the old site and, and rejoin the old queen. So in doing this, you are creating a new hive. So if you've lost a hive, this is a good replacement for it. Um, you've got a new queen that's going to be in that hive, that split that you had. Either you're going to introduce it or they're going to raise it themselves because you put in brood that's in there eggs, young larva, it's got honey for food, it's got pollen, it's got worker bees in there. They will raise a queen if there's not one in there. The downside of this is that you basically did exactly what the swarm did, does. You have duplicated the swarm and minimized your production. And so if, you're, if your purpose of doing the split is to avoid swarming, you just defeated yourself because now you've created a swarm, actually you've created two swarms, I should say, um, in that, or swarm size, in that you've got half of the bees in one box and half of the bees in the other. So what I generally recommend to the beekeepers is, is that don't look at a hive when you're deciding to do a split. Look at the apiary, look at all of the hives that you have and make your split from that apiary, not from the, or I should say from the hives in the apiary, not from the hive. And, and what I'm talking about is that you're going to be taking not half the bees, not half the honey, not half the pollen, but you're going to be taking two or three frames out of a hive and put it into a new hive and then going on to the next hive and taking two or three frames out and put it in into the new hive. And the same thing, you know, three, four, five hives and moving those over. You're weakening these hives, you're decreasing the population of the colony in order to reduce that congestion, which is that swarm prevention you want. So that communication, the queen's communication, her pheromones can be spread around. That can go on inside of these hives uninterrupted, but you've created a new hive over here. And so you've taken four hives and you've created a fifth out of it. Um, you know, again, it may be three hives you can do it with. It may be uh, four, it may take five you need to go into each of the hives and make a determination. How much do I need to take out in order to prevent them to reduce that congestion, but not to interfere with or upset uh, what, the, what, their, what their natural production, what my anticipated production out of that hive is gonna be. And so again, taking out two or three frames, putting it into another, uh, another hive, uh, again, if you've got eggs, young larvae in here, you've got plenty of workers, you've got plenty of honey, you've got plenty of pollen, they will raise a queen. You don't want them to raise it. You want them to get started a little bit earlier. You know, before you do the split, make an order uh, for some queens. When the queens come in, then do your splits so that you've got, um, got it ready to go. <clears throat> Another concept, um, particularly for those that are raising queens or producing uh, nucleus colonies for the for other beekeepers. Um, a good way to make money or a good way to help out the colony is to um, take that hive that you've got and split it into the nukes. So you've got a, a 10 frame box, you've got 20 frames. A, a, a eight frame box, you've got 16 frames in those two boxes that generally is, is your colony or your hive. And so you can break those out and split it into here to make your nukes if that's what you want to do um, in order to make more queens in order to make more money. Or you can use these 
um, again, to uh, produce queens that you can use to requeen those other hives. Because one of the other things that you can do for, to prevent uh, that swarming is to make sure you have a young queen inside of all your colonies. Young queens have a less tendency to swarm than older queens do. So once we get to two, three years of age, those queens are gonna be increasing exponentially, or I should say the hives of those queens are gonna increase exponentially in their desire to swarm. And so requeening every year, every other year reduces their, their, their tendency to swarm because the queen, those younger queens are putting out more queen substance, more queen pheromone. And so it may be, not be as efficient at spreading it around because of the crowding, but because there's more of it, they're still getting sufficient amount to suppress that swarming. So again, <clears throat> another idea of, of how you can do the splits um, to either produce more hives, produce more uh, queens uh, for sale, or uh, to produce queens so that you requeen some of those hives that, uh, that have, have older queens in them. So <clears throat> the bad thing is that if you don't do the, the swarm prevention, and then sometimes even when you do the swarm prevention, you're going to run into problems of it's still going to swarm. Last year was a good example. Um, I had a hive that I that I split, um, that I uh, that I uh, added supers to. I put a new queen in, and one day in in late May or early June, I can't remember the exact day, but I'm walking into the yard and I'm hearing a roar of the of a swarm, and it's coming out of that box. And so last year it was the bees are going to swarm in pretty much anything and everything we did was just not gonna, not gonna work as far as preventing them from, do that, from doing that. Um, so even though you're doing the swarm prevention, you wanna be on the lookout for signs of imminent swarming. And some of those signs are crowding in the brood chamber, of course, uh, queen cells, particularly on the lower frames. Um, easy way to tell if you've got queen cells for swarms, take that upper box, lift it up. If you see queen cells hanging out from the bottom, um, as you can see here, um, then you are probably going to be uh, seeing a swarm shortly if you haven't already seen it. Um, little or no open brood, increased colony noise. Um, there's a roar that occurs prior to and during the swarming. Um, and then of course that increased flight around the hive um, before and during the swarming event. So again, those are things that you wanna look out for for uh, swarming occurring. Um, things that you can do to control the swarming. So once that behavior starts and you need to stop it or reverse it, um, you need to be getting into not the prevention, but the control um, steps. And in that case, reversing the boxes, adding supers, that's not going to help. Sometimes splits do help. <clears throat> Most of the time splits do help and you can do that. But primarily, if you start to see swarm cells like you saw on that other, other slide, um, the Demery method is going to be one of the, 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 the best things that you can do to stop the swarming behavior. Um, it's just a lot of work and a lot of time. And what that entails is that you have to go through this box, remove all of the queen cells that you find, and hopefully you find them all, move all of the cap brood up above into a new box, <clears throat> add another box or, or uh, the box in between uh, the, the, with the three here, is gonna have any leftover cap brood, any open brood, um, put those in here. So we want to basically draw all of the workers up into these two boxes and then separate them with a queen excluder from the queen down below. And what this will do is it'll stretch out those workers, not just between the two boxes, but over the three boxes. If you've removed all the queen cells, <clears throat> then they shouldn't be taken off on a swarm anytime soon. But you do need to come back in about five to seven days and check these two boxes up here for queen cells and remove them again. Because you haven't, just by doing this, you haven't stopped the behavior. You've just delayed it. And what we wanna do is continue to delay, continue to delay it <clears throat> until, the, until the workers get past that, that desire to swarm. And so you'll need to come back in five to seven days, remove any queen cells you see in these upper two boxes, check down here and make sure the queen is laying, that you're not seeing any queen cells in here. Make sure that there's not, that the queen stays down here, the queen excluder is here. Come back in, in uh, um, another five to seven days 
and then check again for any queen cells. If you don't see any queen cells up in here, then you can remove this excluder. These should be hatched out by, or hatching out if not already uh, hatched out by now. These are gonna be coming into the later uh, stages of the, of the pupil uh, or, or stages of pupils of um, development, um, starting to hatch out as well after that 14 days. And so by removing the queen, the queen excluder here, the queen can now start moving up into this box. And, and by then, hopefully that swarm behavior has been controlled or eliminated and that she can continue to lay. Um, the workers have plenty of room to be spread out into. And so um, you should be, again, after a lot of work, a lot of looking, a lot of pulling out of queen cells, a lot of visits to the hive, um, you should get them past that swarming behavior and get them to the point where they, um, they want to stay where they are. So <clears throat> that's the gist of, of uh, what um, I had to say tonight as far as the um, spring management, uh, splits and control of swarming. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, as typical with my, with my talks, um, I've gone a few minutes over, um, but those of you that know me, you should be used to that. There, um, there, is one, there is one question. I don't know if you answered that one. It says, what's your recommendation for brood box reversals for beekeepers that use all eight frame medium boxes throughout their entire hive? The same thing. Eight, same eight, thing. eight frames, 10 frames, it doesn't matter. Um, you want to do those, a minimum of those two reversals, do the same, same activities. Um, it, the one thing that I've learned through the years is that, is that the bees will take off about, use about 90% of the box. Um, if you decrease the size of the box from 10 frames to eight frames, they just use more of the box. Um, and so what you want to do is to make sure they have plenty of room um, mm -hmm. to expand into, um, both for the brood, but also for the workers to expand into, because that congestion in the brood nest is what is the driving force behind the, the swarm behavior developing in that colony. And so if we can keep the bees spread out, um, reversing them, whether it's eight frame or, or 10 frame, um, the, the problem that I, that I see um, as far as the boxes is the, um, you know, I, I think you're gonna have a talk next, next month about the um, Sylvanian hives. Um, yes. Those are ones that it take, it's a different management because again, you're looking at a smaller box and you can't reverse those. Um, so you need to be um, thinking about how to manage the bees to keep that congestion from occurring in the, in the brood nest so that that queen substance can be spread, that queen pheromone can be spread throughout the colony and suppress the worker's desire to replace the queen. All right. Thank you so much, Keith. Uh, that was really informative. I really enjoyed that. Well, it's, it's good to see everybody and I, uh, hopefully everyone is staying healthy. Um, I can see some pictures and names of, of uh, acquaintances, people I know, and so I'm glad to see you, you're out. I, I will put an endorsement in uh, Wednesday night. If you haven't already seen the, the news or the, the email, um, there is uh, the BSBA is going to be having the uh, Detroit Bees um, speak on that. And those are, uh, that's a group, uh, a, a 501c3 group up in Detroit that is establishing apiaries throughout Detroit using some of the abandoned properties. Um, and and uh, I've heard them speak before. It's a fantastic program and, and, uh, and they have a good presentation, a great presentation. So um, I encourage you all to listen in on that um, Wednesday night through the uh, uh, VSBA. Thank you. Yep. I think that's it for tonight. I have nothing more. Okay, well, everyone stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, we will see you out in the field at some point. Yes, Spring is coming, right? Yes. Thank you. Hey, Good night. Keith, okay. this is Matt from uh, Proper yeah. Black. Thank you. Uh, and do you uh, know who uh, our inspector will be uh, this, this season for nukes? Matt, say that again. I was wondering if you uh, had any, any idea who our inspector for the region will be. Um, uh, we're, we're looking at bringing Elizabeth back again, um, but for the, the Central Valley. 
so in your area, you've got Amanda over in the Winchester uh, area, as well as uh, Beth McClellan, um, who's more, uh, I think most of you will probably be calling Beth McClellan. Um, we'll be updating the map that's on their website in the next, uh, next few days. I'm gonna get on our regional managers to sign off on it um, uh, before the end of the week so that we can have that posted. Um, but like I said, there's, there's gonna be some holes in it. We've got a new inspector that's coming in to the Central Valley. Um, she hasn't, doesn't have a whole lot of uh, background in beekeeping and, and uh, uh, bee inspection. So we're looking at, at tr pro uh, trying to bring Elizabeth uh, Cromer back again uh, to cover that area as well as to help out Amanda and Beth um, with some of the apiary inspections. Yeah. And, and Keith, where would I where would I find that info again? You said on the uh, website. Which way? It, if you go to the uh, the Air agency's website, it's uh, vdacs.virginia.gov. Um, uh -huh. Go to the pest uh, plant and pest link, and in that first link that's on uh, that you go to that page, it's uh, beekeeping and apiary program. Mm -hmm. um, and then on there, it's you'll see a, a link to the um, uh, contact information for our apiary inspectors. Okay, super. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. All right. Well, again, y'all have a great night. Okay, thank you. Good night. Bye.